Our next session today is rather aptly titled Myth Busting the Middle East. And if you think of the Middle East, if you're like me, you probably think of oil. So let me ask you a question. How many oil companies are listed across the MENA region? Do you think it's more than three or less than three? This is not for the app, this is just me. So put up your hand if you think it's more than three. Less than three? The answer is zero, which gives you an idea of perhaps how much <laughs> we need to find out about this region. There is a multitude of influences, and many of them are actually not well reported back in this country. I think recent exceptions are the blockade of Qatar and also the recent changes in the leadership lineup of the Saudi royal family. They're definitely exceptions. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Farah Fostock, who is the managing director and senior executive officer of Lazard Golf based in Dubai. Her full bio is on the app, but I just wanted to point out to you that uh, in 2013, Farah co-founded the first non-profit female mentoring program in the Dubai Finance Centre called REACH. Please welcome Farah. Now just to, to remind you that you can ask your questions throughout uh, our discussion here through the app and also just to let you know that uh, Farah has a full slide pack that uh, is on the app as well, but we're not going to go through it. We're going to run this session more like a conversation. So before we start, let's have a look at your responses. Less than 10%, 62%. But still quite a chunk of people who actually don't know. So there you go. Well, Farah, let's start with the very big picture. If you can take us through the key markets of the Middle East and North Africa before we focus on some of the more pertinent ones. Okay, so I think we have a map up here. So for us, how we define the Middle East is the GCC block, which you see in the blue area, we see Saudi Arabia. So that's the six GCC countries. We have the North African countries, the Arabic speaking ones, which is Egypt, Tunisia, and Morocco. And we have what we call the Levant, which is Lebanon and Jordan. These are the countries that from an investable perspective, we call the investable universe. Or, and within this universe, you have around 1,640 investable stocks. And one interesting thing is that less than 20% of these stocks are actually covered by third-party research. So there's a massive opportunity of potential mispricing and discovery within these markets. One of the interesting things about the region is, uh, and that maybe people don't know, is the low levels of leverage in these economies. So if you look at the Gulf states, which is the Saudi and the, and the remaining uh, surrounding countries, the GCC, you have most of these countries have debt to GDP of government debt to GDP less than 20%. In fact, Saudi is less than 10%. Qatar is probably the highest. And their corporate debt is less than 70%. These countries have also accumulated uh, considerable surpluses over the years and are reinvesting these surpluses into sustainable or strategic sectors. In 2015, there was a report by ENY that quoted the wealth of the GCC sovereigns at $3 trillion. It was also the wealth of family offices in the region at $3 trillion. So if you look at Saudi alone, and we probably refer to Saudi more than any of the others because it's the largest of the countries, Saudi represents around 55% of the market cap of the region and about 70% of the liquidity. Um, one, of the, one area that is actually potentially a, an opportunity, but also an area for them to, to balance, is the demographics of the region. 50% of the population of the region are below the age of 25. If you look at Saudi specifically, you have about 17% of youth unemployment, and you have only 8.2% of women in the workforce, participation of women in the workforce. So there is a huge opportunity for them to tap into these resources, and at the same time to balance the potential social unrest from the youth area. So, I mean, from a macro perspective, I think that gives us a little bit of a picture uh, of the Middle East. One of the points, and you just made it then, is that it is a very liquid region. It doesn't really need the cash. So how much harder does that make valuations across MENA? So I think the two areas, one is the wealth of the governments, and the governments have continued to invest into sustainable sectors, but the capital markets themselves still need quite a lot of development. 
so if you look at Saudi in representation on an EM scale, Saudi today represents from a market cap perspective probably the eighth largest of the EM countries and the ninth most liquid of the EM countries, but that's Saudi. The other countries are still quite small. Um, and the wealth itself, a lot of it is also sent outside. So a lot of the family wealth, they have operating businesses in the region, but a lot of their investment capital is, invest is diversified and invested outside. Same with the sovereign wealth funds of the region. Uh, uh, the Saudi central bank, and doesn't like to be referred as a sovereign, at one point had over a trillion dollars in assets. The last number that is publicly quoted is around 480, 500 billion dollars. They've been eroding 100 billion dollars a year for the last couple of years, because remember their break-even level for many of these economies is between 60 and 80 dollars a barrel. Today we're at 50. Um, so they need to attract capital because they need to diversify their economies and they need to open up their capital markets. So the capital they're trying to attract now is to, into new sectors, uh, foreign direct investment to diversify their economy and also into their capital markets. But, but you did make the point that there's not a lot of uh, stocks that are actually being analysed in the region. So there must be a lot of mispricing. And I suppose that does create a huge amount of opportunity, but it makes it hard to work mm -hmm. out where the prices should be set. Sure. So from a valuation perspective, I think we're still probably on a par uh, with the emerging markets. So we're probably mid-teens in terms of PEs, return on equity around 11%. Uh, the interesting thing about the region is the dividend yield. So we're probably around 4% dividend yields versus EM around 2.5. Um, again, if you look at the indices, they're not representative for us from a valuation perspective or of the markets. And I think you'll have, you have a chart inside your deck that shows the small mid-cap uh, index versus the large, and you'll see the massive mispricing opportunities that exist, which for us as fundamental investors is where we find opportunities. So identifying those companies that are not on the radar screen, that have the potential to unlock value, uh, that are mispriced, uh, that where we can potentially see a lot of upside. You talked about the price of oil and how that has changed. How linked to the opportunities in the region to economic reform to move these countries away from reliance on oil? So if we focus on maybe Saudi and the UAE, which have done the most, uh, Saudi, as you, you've all seen in headline news, buying or investing into Uber, SoftBank, they just announced a recent deal, $40 billion into Blackstone's infrastructure fund, two-thirds US, one-third uh, international but they need to create new industries. So this is not gonna happen overnight. Saudi Arabia has a national transformation plan. Uh, they also have a vision 2030, which is clearly focused on the development of new sectors. You have privatization, so Aramco, which everybody's probably heard of, two trillion flotation, um, expected to happen in the next couple of years. So the sale of state assets is one of the areas they're going down to basically diversify their economies and to free up some of their capital. There have been $400 billion of unutilized assets sitting between ministries that have been taken over and transferred to the new sovereign wealth fund, the public investment fund, to be used effectively. In Saudi, they also imposed a white land tax, so anybody that owns land but is not developing the land has to either develop or pay a tax. The GCC, the whole of the GCC is starting to impose VAT next year, January. Um, subsidies were removed uh, for many of the locals and then reinstated in Saudi Arabia in April of this year because I think the reforms were just too fast. So there are a lot of things that are happening where they're trying to diversify economies, they're trying to open up capital markets. I think you're going to touch on later on the MSCI. Um, and this is an evolution. But the interesting thing and, and I guess the challenge is balancing the social reform the social contract between governments and the locals is changing. And um, there's a mindset in Saudi. I mean, I think the older generation are not used to having women in the workforce. Women have only been allowed to work in retail in Saudi in the last year or two. Uh, and we all know that women don't drive right now in Saudi Arabia, although I think probably would be a nightmare if we had women on the streets. <laughs> you shouldn't say that. Um, I will get, I'll get to that issue of, of greater diversity in the workforce in a minute, but let's focus on, on Saudi Arabia because it is so fascinating. The recent changes in the leadership lineup and um, the elevation of Mohammed bin Salman now to Crown Prince, which it does change the game, doesn't it? And, and I do have to point out for people who don't know, and I know you have a very good response to this, but uh, 
He's just 32. His ambassador to the US is only 28, and his interior minister is 36. So it's a whole generational mm -hmm. shift, if you like. Um, how does that change the game? Well, one, I think it brings in fresh blood. Uh, change is required, and maybe drastic change is the way to go, uh, because you do have, so they have transformed the way ministries operate. They've changed the leadership of 12 ministries in Saudi. They've set KPIs for all these ministries, and people are held accountable. So you have a mixed group of people that say, this is too fast, and you have others that say, this is required and needed. And if it doesn't happen now, when will it happen? So you're going from economies that have been used to economic prosperity to austerity. And so if they're ever going to do it, they need to do it now. And they're forced to do it now. But, but who has the power? So in Saudi, you used to have three factions of power, the royal family, the merchant families, and the religious police. The religious police power has been taken away to some extent. They actually almost act as employees now of the royal family. And Hamad bin Salman is responsible. He's the minister of defense. He also has an economic council, which was created when he came to power. Um, and underneath the economic council, you have the PIF, which is the public investment fund. The new sovereign wealth fund reports into that. Aramco is reporting into that. So he controls defense, oil, and money, effectively. He controls the country. Um, which sort of begs the question of, well, why can't he just ram everything through? And why do we have this, you know, I mean, on, on the social front and, and the idea of women and young people in, in the workforce, I mean, why aren't we seeing more rapid change? We have 32 million people in Saudi Arabia, and I guess they only have to look across their borders at Egypt, which has 95 million people and had social unrest not too long ago. And so I, I think they're trying to balance the powers and they tr need, they need to have buy-in or they'd like to have buy-in from the people. Uh, and the local populations, not only in Saudi, but also in Qatar and in UAE, are not used to having to work for everything in life. I mean, they, they are in many cases have lived on subsidies. And again, the social contract is changing. They, they need to now perform effectively. Um, but you need to remember that there's been a lot of investment in education and healthcare over the last 10 plus years. 20 to 25 percent of the budget of Saudi Arabia over the last 10 years plus has been into education and healthcare. And every year for over 10 years, uh, there was a program set up by the former King Abdullah where 100 to 150,000 Saudi students were sent. Uh, to scholar on scholarships, full scholarships to international universities. And many of these are coming back now. So you have a very educated workforce and literacy rates have increased from 50% 50, 50 to 80% over the last 25 years. So you have a, a new breed, if you like, of millennials uh, and putting them into the workforce. They may not have the experience of the older generation, but it's a new mindset and I think it's needed. How healthy is the Saudi economy? So I think uh, we have probably have economists in the crowd. Uh, healthy is an interesting question because they have the surpluses. They clearly are not at a level of break even now. Uh, and they're working to consolidate industries, lower their spending, cutting their subsidies, diversifying their economies, transforming their economy. But today they're not at break even levels, so they continue to spend their reserves. Their levels of debt are very low, so they can very easily issue debt. In November of last year, Saudi did an international bond issue. They raised $17.4 billion and it was uh, four times oversubscribed. So there's appetite for their debt. So, so today, I would say the wealth is there. Health-wise, they need to diversify their economy. They need to diversify away from oil. If they're able to achieve the growth of the industries they're trying to create, then I guess we can answer that question in 20 years' time. So that brings me to the question of how important the float of a stake in Aramco is, which uh, I know you, you were saying to me that advisors have now been appointed. The amount of money that's being talked about for 10% of this oil company is just extraordinary. But, I mean, is, is that crucial to funding this Vision 2030 plan? No, because they still have the wealth in the central bank. They have the ability to tap into debt. But this is one of the things that they need to do um, to start privatizing state assets. And it's a very bold move. And they are doing this alongside the potential upgrade of Saudi into emerging market status. So June 20th, 
MSCI officially announced that Saudi is now on the watch list for upgrading to EM. Today, without the uh, inclusion of Aramco, that would represent around 2.5 to 3 percent. Today, you have only three countries that are represented in EM. So you have Egypt, Qatar, and the UAE, which represent around 1.5 percent of EM. So if you add Saudi to that, you're over 4 percent of EM. If you include Aramco, you're then closer to 6 percent, uh, 5 or 6 percent. So that becomes a significant weighting in EM. And that's uh, a game changer? Absolutely, because I don't think anybody will come to the region to invest just in Saudi. They will look at Saudi and they look at the surrounding countries and they will look for opportunities. I want to ask you about specific uh, investment opportunities, but first of all I'd like to look at another really interesting country that has made the news headlines in this part of the world, and that is Qatar and the... Uh, well, it's been isolated, it's been sanctioned by its neighbours uh, for its alleged support of terrorism. And I wanted to ask you what it's actually all about, because if you look at volume terms, isn't Saudi Arabia the biggest funder of terrorist groups? I mean, what is actually happening here? So I think it's very interesting what's happening, and I think there is a potential opportunity, but also a potential risk. So you have effectively, they have effectively now split and redefined the GCC. You have two new alliances, one alliance, which is, I think, the not so uh, positive, is uh, Iran, Turkey, and Qatar. Qatar has today $335 billion in their sovereign wealth fund. Turkey uh, is home publicly of the Muslim Brotherhood and now has troops on the ground in Qatar. Iran is supplying goods to Qatar and has its own uh, fundamental views. So you have aligned now military wealth, uh, Islamic or religious fundamentalism with uh, wealth in the country, which is not so positive. And it reminds me a little bit of when the Americans and the Saudis armed Osama bin Laden to fight the Russians in Afghanistan and unleashed war on the world in the future. So I hope that strategically they know what they're doing there. On the other side, I think it's extremely interesting what's happening is you have an alliance between Saudi, Egypt, the UAE, and Israel, which nobody is really talking about. And there are public transcripts of when Donald Trump visited Israel and he flew from Riyadh to Tel Aviv in a private plane. And when he arrived, Netanyahu asked him, where have you come from? And he said, I've come from Riyadh. And Netanyahu said, I would love to take a flight from Tel Aviv to Riyadh. So we be I believe personally that there are economic links that are being formed there, not just political links. We heard about a month ago, earlier in August, that Israeli companies were putting operations on the ground for the first time in Egypt. There has always been a good political link, but an economic link has never happened. Uh, and I think this could be another game changer for the Middle East, because clearly if Israel can come in and show some of these Arab countries how to effectively use their capital, how to develop their industries that could be beneficial for both sides. And just looking at Qatar itself and the impact of the blockade, how big an impact is it having and how vulnerable is Qatar to sanctions? Because it's very state dominated as an economy, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think Qatar in the scope of things, so Qatar has a population of 2.5 million. The local population is 10%. So you can put the Qataris into one hotel. Um, and there are very few com companies in the region that have a large exposure to Qatar. So there is one company in Saudi, Al Marai, which is an uh, agriculture company. Less than 5% of their revenues is from Qatar. There is one company that we've identified that sits on the border between Qatar and Saudi, which is a very tiny company, agriculture, private, has closed their business. But other regional companies we don't see as very affected. And the representation of Qatar in the market is tiny. So as an economy, it's not really having an impact on the other countries. Themselves, they'd be impacted because they obviously have to become self-sustainable. We heard that they flew in 4,000 cows into the north of Qatar and started creating their own milk and their own products and agriculture industry. Um, and they are saying publicly in the news, thank you very much for what you've done to the Gulf because you've made us self-sustainable.
Well, I guess the, if it's not an economic, broader economic impact, the question then becomes how that shifting power balance plays out and over what time period. Mm. And I ask you that with the thinking that, you know, as a, an investor sitting in Australia, it's just... You know, I couldn't make notes while you were talking then, but I felt I needed to because it's not an easy region to get your head around. Mm. So what does that mean for the investor? As you mean Qatar specifically? Well, well, Qatar, Qatar and the changing power balance and then just more broadly what's happening. So Qatar, for investors that sit in the Middle East, investing in the Middle East, that understand the Middle East, Qatar is insignificant to us. It's clearly affecting logistics of moving around but Oman, for instance, is benefiting from what's happening because Oman still has very strong links with Iran and the rest of the region. So their banks are benefiting, their companies are benefiting from some of the trade. So you're always going to have losers and winners. We don't see it as a big game changer economically yet. And we don't see it, the impact on corporates yet. But the, the shifting Qataris, power yes. balance must be of concern for the longer term. No, because the larger economies for us are... Saudi, UAE, Kuwait, not Qatar. And you already saw a shift in power when the former emir stepped down. And I don't know how many, much you may know about the history of Qatar. His, Qatar only became independent in 1971. They were invited to join the UAE as one of the states, and they declined. And in Qatar's history, most of the emirs, all of the emirs in the past, have either been ousted or killed. The first time ever that an emir stepped down and abdicated was this one, the father of the current emir. And when that happened, in fact, many of the other uh, Gulf states didn't actually believe it was happening for the right reasons. So they believed that he was continuing to support the wrong factions from behind the scenes. And one of the 10-point plan that you've seen publicly announced that is the demands of the states for Qatar to be removed from the blockade. Which Qatar has rejected. Yeah. So I think one of the most important ones there is the voice of Al Jazeera, which is a uh, international news agency now, and how this voice has been used publicly to speak against the ruling families uh, and the political uh, region or the, the political parties or the ruling parties of the other states. And so what they're actually asking is for Qatar to stop using Al Jazeera to manipulate and uh, undermine the leadership of the other countries. That's really their biggest demand. And of course, Qatar is saying, no, we will not shut down Al Jazeera. So where does this leave the biggest opportunities if you're, and accepting that Saudi Arabia is by far, you know, I suppose the biggest focus, where should people be looking? So again, where we see opportunities is small mid-cap companies. Um, many of them are majority family owned. Many of the ownership in Saudi is government owned. The government is going to start now uh, selling off these stakes because they're the largest owner of the stock, stock market companies, public companies, uh, but the liquidity is mostly uh, retail. And whether it's insurance companies or sovereign wealth funds, they will start now uh, dis disposing of their uh, stakes in these companies. For us, the opportunity has always been in the small mid-cap space. Uh, where Particular sectors, like industries? So we, we have found interesting tobacco companies from Jordan in the past, um, ceramic companies, consumer-related companies, and... We, we tend to choose companies where the management is accessible and interested in unlocking value. And this is no financial engineering, so as, a, as an asset manager, we don't go in and advise them to delist or relist. It's more create an investor relations department, pay out dividends, sell non-core assets. It's simple things that really can change the dynamics of the country. And these companies, in many cases, are very well-managed companies with visibility on cash flow, uh, but people don't know about them. They're completely mispriced and undervalued. Uh, I, I noticed that you said tobacco there. I've got a, a question from the floor, and I do urge you to, to ask your questions, but it says, how do you approach ESG issues within the region? Oh, we just talk about tobacco company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. So if you look at um, 
and maybe corporate governance is not the same as ESG, but we have a chart also that shows the corporate governance and, uh, and how companies that have improved their corporate governance, how outperformed the traditional companies that haven't by about 56% since 2009. Uh, for us as investors, we spend a lot of time with companies. We're fundamental investors, so we don't invest in businesses we don't understand. We meet with the management, we do uh, site visits, and we all ask all the questions around socially responsible environment. It doesn't mean that a company like tobacco we wouldn't invest in. It's not part of our investment process, but we are conscious more of corporate governance than necessarily ESG. And Take us through governance standards in the region. I think Saudi Arabia has just got a new uh, governance standard or governance mm -hmm. regulations, but what is it like on the whole? Is it consistent, I suppose? So when question? I arrived in the region 2005, most of the companies in Saudi did not have financial statements in English. Uh, they all have now financial statements in English. Investor relations was not something that was very prominent. Now, all Saudi companies are required to have investor relations department, so are the UAE. In Saudi, the new code dictates that there must be independent directors on the board, uh, more accountability, audit uh, committees, and this is all preparing for MSCI upgrade. Uh, so I think it's also the, for them to attract international investors, we need to raise the bar in terms of corporate governance and best practices. So do you wait until the bar has been raised? No, I spend a lot of time actually, myself and the team, speaking to regulators, stock exchanges, and public companies on what we require them to do. But just to give you an idea of how much it's changed, uh, 12 years ago, when we were invested in a real estate company called IMR, which is the largest real estate company in the UAE, I called them and said from the asset management side, can we have a meeting with the CFO? And he said, no, your research department has just downgraded the stock. Read the research. I said, yes, but that's the research department. That's sell side. We are the buy side. We'd like to have a meeting with the company. We're shareholders. He said, no, just read the research and refused to take the meeting. Today, they are the most active company when it comes to international roadshows, quarterly calls with investors, uh, constantly on, on the road, investor relations departments. It's an evolution. I remember that some of these markets are not even frontier. I guess uh, this next question from the floor sort of reflects some of what I've been asking, but we can't know how required change will play out in Saudi, and you could probably say across the region as well. So shouldn't we just stand back until it's all sorted? Yeah, I mean, as investors, you always have that opportunity, but the mispricing starts to disappear as efficiency comes into the market. So, so, so you might miss the boat, essentially. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure long-term investors can ever time the market. A another question from the floor. Will the work ethic in Saudi public companies impact productivity, hours worked per week, as they transition to private companies? So we're talking about the efficiency of the labor force? I or think so, in the public versus private sector. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, clearly the... Way, I mean, I, I had, so UAE, Saudi, it's all similar. I had a lady that came once to me at a UAE forum and said to me, and she was a local, and she said, if I apply for a job, would you hire me? I said, well, if you apply for a job and you qualify, I might hire you. And she said, okay, but I work government hours. And I said, and what are government hours? And she said, nine to three. And I said, well, we don't work government hours. We work nine hours a day. And as long as you're willing to work the same as everyone else, then, and you're qualified, I'm sure we can, we can think about hiring you. And then she said, oh, no, no, but I have to leave early because of this and that, and I have children. I said, well, I have children too. And um, if you work in a private company, you need to work under the terms of everybody else. And uh, that didn't necessarily suit her. And so, yes, if they want to compete and work in the private sector, they need to compete with the expats that are working in the private sector. But there are quotas on some companies that have to hire a certain number of nationals. So you are forced in some cases, depending on your industry, uh, on the number of locals you have in your company. You Obviously that was a story involving a woman in the workforce and you were talking about the huge number of young people and of course the very few women who are in the workforce. 
how much do you see that changing? And as I said earlier, you know, you, you're very much working in this space to try and get change. How much has it changed while you've been in the region? I think you've been in Dubai for 13, 12, yeah. 12 13 years. And how much do you see it changing in the future? So when I first started going to Saudi, and maybe I remind everybody that I was born in Beirut, but from 1975 until 2005, I didn't go to a single Arab, Arab country. Um, so I had no idea what to expect when I moved to Dubai. And I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and I arrived in Dubai, and they were looking around, and they saw the ladies that were covered in black, and the three-year-old would say, who's that? And I would say, they're friends of Darth Vader, because <laughs> I didn't know what to say to them. Um, and when I started traveling to Saudi, and my mother is Saudi, I would sit in meetings and I would have no eye contact from anybody in the room. No male would ever look at me. And so I would think that I have something on my head or on my teeth, or I didn't understand why they're not looking at me, because in the Western world you're taught that eye contact is trust. And it took me two years, and maybe my competitive spirit, and I, I decided that I'm going to keep going back until they look at me. And eventually I asked the question, why would they not making eye contact? And they said, well, out of respect for you, we didn't want to make you feel intimidated. And then I developed a very strong relationship with many of the senior leaders, and I mentor many of their daughters. And I feel today, as an Arab woman, more respected working in the Middle East than I have ever felt anywhere else in the world. And I think there's a complete misperception of how women are treated there. Women are treated with the utmost respect uh, as women. They are elevated by the educated, and I think there is a big difference between the uneducated and the educated in any nation. Um, and so... So why are less than 10% of them in the workforce? It's a mindset. They have protected the women, and the women have not been in the workforce. Today, if you look at the Shura Council, which is the council that is advising the king, 30% of this council are women, and they're all PhDs. Uh, that's the highest percentage of all the GCC. You have the chairperson, chairwoman of the stock exchange in Saudi Arabia is a woman. I don't believe we have a chairperson of any stock exchange anywhere in the world that is a woman. Three financial institutions, the largest financial institutions, uh, NCB Capital, Samba, and Citi, have women as CEOs in Saudi Arabia. Um, and you have ministers in, we have a minister of tolerance in the UAE who is a woman. Um, but is that, is that perhaps the, the disconnect that you have incredibly strong intelligent, educated women who are prepared to push, but the rest of them just get left being looked after by the male population. I mean, how do you get that 8 10% to be a far higher figure? So maybe the, the, all the noise that we're hearing now and the progress that we're seeing is because we're coming from a very low base. Uh, and so the, the only way is up. Um, there is definitely a lot that needs to happen. So one of the problems, I think, is infrastructure. If you go to Saudi Arabia, in many of the government buildings that I visit today, there are no female bathrooms. So I walk into meetings, I'm on roadshows, and I have to go and ask for a special key from a security guard to go to another bathroom with a security guard outside to go to the bathroom. So, and women can't drive. They're at Uber now. But so logistically, it's not that easy for women to move around. And then the, the level of education, the quality of education has changed. So there's a university in Saudi called the King Faisal University, which is the first co-ed university in Saudi, unofficially co-ed. The men are sitting downstairs, the women are upstairs, there's a screen that goes up in case the Ministry of Finance comes in, or Ministry of Education comes in. And the professor is the same professor. It's the first time in Riyadh that you have the same professor teaching the boys and the girls. The campuses are separate. And for the first time, they're putting, in the last couple of years, the grades of the boys and girls on both sides. And guess what? The women are outperforming the men in everything. Um, so I'm not worried about the women in the Middle East. I'm worried about the men. <laughs> then given that optimistic scenario, how long do you think it will be until you have a far uh, fairer representation of women in the workforce? Well, I think you have very strong leadership support, so whether it's the royal families of Saudi, the ruling family of the UAE, you have very strong support. In Kuwait, you have women as ministers already. In the UAE, you have ministerial positions already. Saudi, you don't yet. Um, I would like to think that by the time my daughter has reached the time to work, I would think in the next 10 years, I would hope that you will see a massive change in the workforce. They recognize that this is a resource that is untapped, uh, 
And today, in their current environment, they need to tap the resources. And uh, talking about that economic imperative, you also mentioned the, the huge number of young people who are not uh, employed. Where do they find jobs? Where do they, I mean, it's not hugely educated population, but what sort of areas are they going to go into? So you have a lot of support right now, uh, central banks and sovereign wealth funds creating funds for SMEs, entrepreneurs, crowdfunding, VC platforms. Um, you have a new fintech industry that's been launched in the Dubai Financial Center. Abu Dhabi is also pushing this. So it's starting, um, and there are phenomenal entrepreneurs there. Access to funding has not been so easy. And then you have, obviously, legislation. You have uh, bankruptcy laws are not effectively in place yet. So you still have an infrastructure that needs to develop uh, before you get more growth and more opportunities for youth. Can I ask if there are any questions from the floor? I've got one down the front here. So just wait a tick that someone's coming with a microphone. I just wanted to ask, um, when you talk about Saudi Arabia, I think Yemen is always on the cards. So, you know, through, through my reading of the situation, which I follow quite closely, um, the bombing campaign for the last two years has actually exacerbated the human, human crisis in Yemen. The UN today says it's the biggest human, humanitarian crisis in the world at this point in time. There was a really good documentary that was done by an ABC correspondent from Australia, um, which basically highlighted that the Yemenis population um, have sort of more emboldened their, their views um, and made them more aligned with the Houthi rebels. Whereas prior to the bombing campaign, the Houthi rebels were probably not in majority, they were probably in the minority. And um, this correspondent basically said that it has emboldened not only the current generation, but for the future generations to come with respect to making sure they get their revenge on Saudi Arabia. So how do you, how do you see um, the war, which has basically happened for the last two years, and Saudi have actually not achieved the objectives that they've set out to achieve? In fact, it's actually only got worse. And you couple that with the Shia uprising through the influence of Iran in the region. Um, how do you see that all playing out with Saudi Arabia? It seems like a very dim picture for Saudi Arabia from my reading of the situation. Right, that's a good question. So, I mean, I think we've always had and we've always lived with the Shia Sunni uh, situation for many, many years. It was only in 1979 where you had the siege of Mecca, and I don't know how far back you know, where it was somebody from the National Guard of Saudi, who was actually Sunni, uh, with a group of people took the Holy Mosque, closed it down. At the same time, there was a Shia uprising in uh, the border, in the eastern province. They contained that, but by force. And uh, they eventually negotiated uh, with, well, they captured the, the Holy Mosque. And that was a Sunni uprising within the country of Saudi Arabia, revolting against the royal family because they had become too open and that women at the time were talking publicly on television stations, and that was only 1979. So there have been dramatic shifts and changes uh, in this region. Clearly, the Saudi uh, royal family was extremely nervous during the times of Barack Obama, when Iran was becoming closer to the United States and potential sanctions were being removed and the doors were being opened. Uh, they obviously feel a lot more comfortable now uh, in President uh, Donald Trump's era where that's being more contained. Um, I think it's very difficult to say what happens between the Shia and Sunni because it is definitely a very, very sensitive area for Saudi and they will continue and have always tried to contain uh, the Shia population, not necessarily um, strategically more tactically, I would say. You have the same situation in Bahrain. A lot of the population in Bahrain are, are Shia. Same with Oman. And that's always been the case. So I don't know how this affects the economic situation. Do, do investors need to look at it through a, a, a Shia Saudi prism? Um, for us, we look at companies, and we're not seeing the impact on companies. 
So we've been investing in the region for 15 years. Today, we don't see the impact on companies. We definitely have to look at political situation. We definitely have to look at the political risks. But we don't see that impacting necessarily on the ground companies. Whether it has more impact over the next 10 years, hard to say. Today, we say we see relative stability in the GCC. We have currencies that are pegged to the dollar. So we have economic stability, but it's a very new era, a different era. You're going from an, area, an, a, an economic prosperity to austerity, and there are a lot of changes that are, that are happening all at the same time. And so they're managing austerity, political change, and potential social unrest. And it's something that they have to balance very carefully. But I think the Sunni Shia situation has been going, going on for decades. And it's something that we see rising and falling from time to time. Uh, I would hope that the political regime, and you're seeing more discussions between Mohammed bin Salman and the Iranians, and you would hope that they would, for the better good of all, try to come to some kind of terms. Hard to say where that goes. You probably know more than I do since you're following it very closely. As you say, you look at companies, a question from the floor here, what is the right benchmark for these investments, especially to capture the risk? So, I mean, I guess it depends on you as an investor. Are you? We don't follow benchmarks. We're benchmark unaware, and we're investing in the fundamentals of companies. We're looking for uh, mispriced companies where we can unlock value. So we don't look at benchmarks. And if somebody's benchmarked to the MSCI, we think that's flawed because it's market cap based and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, give you exposure of the region. It's so not. what are your performance measures? So again, we are compared to the benchmark, but we don't make our allocations or decisions based on the benchmark. Uh, and a question, we've sort of touched on this, but I'll put it to you anyway. How will the Qatar boycott golf crisis play out? I wonder whether you can uh, make a, give us your top tip on when you think it's actually going to, if it will ever uh, end or how it will end. Yeah, very difficult one to, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to predict when this will end because I, I think as far as the Gulf is concerned, they're not as impacted as I would, as we, we think, we're not, they're not as impacted. I honestly think that what we read in the news is, I don't want to repeat what Donald Trump says, but fake news. Uh, I think much of the news that you hear around the Middle East is pushed news, uh, and they are just giving us information to read is what information they want us to see. I think there are a lot of political decisions and negotiations going on in the background that we, don't, we have no idea about. It's not in anyone's benefit for this to go on for too long. The, uh, the issue of women in the workforce has obviously sparked, there's a, a, a couple of questions here, uh, essentially that if women are not provided with toilet facilities in public places or workplaces, they're not welcome. I mean, is it a, a lack of respect? No, I think they clearly were not part of the workforce for a long time, have not been part of the workforce for a long time. And uh, women never worked in retail also. They've only been in retail in the last two years. So this is something that they have to develop. Uh, if they want to, you know, if also in many of the offices, you had to have clear segregation between the men and the women. You now have more commingling. So it's an infrastructure issue. If you want women to be sitting in the workforce, if you want them to be able to logistically move around, they need to be able to drive, they need to have, you know, access to facilities in the workforce. The infrastructure has to develop, absolutely. I suppose you, you made the point earlier that there is a very well-educated population, but there's a great deal of difference between the educated and the uneducated. And, and you've also made the point that the issue of women in the workforce goes way beyond uh, just you know, what one sees on the surface. It's cultural, it's historical, it's religious. Given that, despite the economic imperative, how do you, I mean, you know, we, we look at the, the issues in Australia and everyone in this room would be incredibly aware of the, the push towards diversity and to getting more women on boards and all that sort of thing. We have no problems compared to what's going on in the Middle East. How do you over, how does a, a, a government overcome something like that? Because by the sheer fact that it's so deeply ingrained and so much a part of the culture mm -hmm. and the religious background. Yeah, I mean, I think you, baby steps. Right? And, and I think you can't always blame it on the organization or the government. You know, there's also a lot of development that has to occur with women themselves, and that's women globally. 
Um, so, you know, I spend a lot of time in our offices talking to people across the world. And I think in many cases, women all, in many cases, women have a lack of confidence, uh, whether that starts at an early age, and my belief is that it starts at school age where women do not participate enough in team sports. So I tell my children that they're not allowed to go one semester without doing team sports, because I think that embeds into the DNA of both boys and girls, whether it's competitive, whether it's collaborative, it's tools, soft skills that you don't necessarily learn all the way through life. Uh, networking. Women don't naturally build professional networks as well as men. Whether it's distraction from family, whatever it may be, I don't see and meet many women that have global professional networks. Uh, most men do that very naturally, and we, sh and we should learn from that. Uh, and the other thing is, whether it's a mentor or a sponsor or your personal board of advisors, women should actively look, and men actually, for their personal board of advisors of people that are outside of their comfort zone, that have no vested interest in them, that are guiding and advising them in the future. You don't have this mentality in the Middle East. It's so far from, and so that's why we launched the first female nonprofit mentoring program. We've mentored over 200 professional women in the last uh, three years. Is it, just tell us about that. When you mentor these women, what are they telling you? What, why have they joined the program? And where have they ended up? So these are women who are in the corporate world who have two to seven years work experience and they want a role model, an advisor, somebody to guide them. Uh, one lady uh, last year was at Bain. She got a full scholarship to Wharton. Uh, she's now doing her MBA at Wharton. Others that are Emiratis have come to me and said this has transformed their life, uh, which is it's very satisfying, fulfilling to hear. It's really asking them difficult questions they wouldn't normally ask because they don't have necessarily access to role models. Many people sit on the stage and talk and are public figures, but they're not accessible to help the next generation uh, cre create this path. So it's, it's guidance. It's, it's actually making yourself accessible to people, which not everybody does. So another question from the floor. Just down here. Um, you touched on this before uh, in terms of uh, emiratization, omenization, Saudiization, and what I'm trying to reconcile is a as these countries try and f free up companies from public control and public policy like that, but in an environment of a birth rate of eight and uh, young people more and more having to get jobs, isn't there an investment, an inherent investment risk, I guess, with overwhelming uh, force of public policy to hire locals no matter their skill skills and force out, I guess, expats and, and having a negative impact on the companies? Can yep. I, sorry, just before you answer, Farah, I just have to let the people at the back of the room know that we've lost our timer. So we could sit here all afternoon if you, if you don't put something up just to guide us. But anyway, please, please answer. So yeah, I mean, you're bringing up a very important point, which clearly many companies are facing today because you have seen uh, consolidation of some of these industries and the expats are being let go. And the expats are the ones who are experienced and who are training and developing the locals. Uh, and there are companies now that are being forced to hire locals and that's, there are less skilled, for sure. So what we're seeing some people do is bring in consultants who are not full-time, that are expats coming in, training and developing. You're seeing more of the locals going on training programs, uh, sending them outside on internships, on secondments. Uh, it's, it's clearly a challenge. Uh, it's absolutely a challenge for them that as they want to hire more locals and put them into the workforce, they are taking the risk that their companies are hiring less skilled. Uh, and that's definitely something that they have to be aware of, and we are all aware of it. If I can just finish with a very quick question to you, and, and I wonder whether you can tell people in the room how big a role the MENA market should play in an emerging markets portfolio. You can always plumb for small, medium, or large if you don't want to give a percentage. Well, so I guess it depends on how large EM plays uh, in the, because if you look at just the, the, I guess the representation of the Middle East uh, with Saudi and with Aramco, at a best case scenario, you're talking about five to six percent. 
of the EM portfolio. So I'll go with that. Five to six percent. Please join me in thanking Farah very much for her insights.